Hi guys, good morning. Hope uh, everyone is doing well. Thursday the 31st of October, otherwise known as Halloween, uh, the fake Brexit day, which of course has now been pushed down to the 31st of January and uh, the last day in office for Mario Draghi and actually John Burko uh, as well. Um, so an emotional day across the markets, but looks to be uh, a good one, certainly on the calendar. Uh, another jam-packed day. Uh, we'll have a, a quick look over the, the charts from yesterday, the, the headlines that brought us to, to where we are. Uh, so we're, we're best prepared going forward. Just having a, a quick look at those charts and, and bringing uh, here on the left-hand side, you've got the euro dollar, uh, middle top, gold, bottom T-notes and S&P on the right-hand side. You can see overall the markets have taken the, the Fed cut as expected uh, of a, a 25 basis point. They've taken it uh, as an overall dovish reaction. Um, initially hawkish as, as euro dollar came under some pressure as did gold, S&P uh, and T-notes only to reverse into the back end of the session and the S&P printing a new all-time high uh, late last night. Uh, hitting 30.55. We'll come on to the importance of that area shortly, uh, as we know uh, that is near where the trend channel comes in. So overall, um, you can see a, a dovish reaction in markets today. Whether that's going to be long-lasting or not, I think, uh, is going to be up for debate. Uh, there's a long time to the next meeting, I think 41 days off the top of my head, um, until uh, December uh, meeting so a fair bit of data to come between now and then uh, and for the Fed to, to make their decision and, and what pri will be priced in will be priced in also yesterday I'm just going to bring S&P into the full screen now uh, a couple of comments uh, around the, the Chile summit and spiked uh, the S&P lower I'll just bring this in unfortunately not much can be done about this the the algo is taking uh, it as the fact that Trump and Xi would not be uh, meeting and signing the first part of that deal, negative for stocks, only to realise it was uh, cancelled uh, because uh, of civil unrest within Chile. And actually, it's the, the first cancellation in 31 years. Um, but of course, this is where Trump had hoped to sign a deal. There's been no um, clarification where else they are going to, but there's no real negative fallout from this. And uh, the algos effectively got it wrong, uh, and we went back to exactly where we were. Uh, within the five minutes. Uh, also yesterday, data-wise, we had oil numbers out uh, earlier than expected, uh, earlier than usual, I should say, of the, of the 2.30 uh, release, just highlighting that there. Let's put a little circle where it came out. A bigger than expected draw uh, of 5.7 million forecast of only just over just over half, and, and we came under significant pressure, uh, getting us down to the low that we had from yesterday and beyond, only to find support around 54.50 and push higher in, in late trade, mainly thanks to the weaker US dollar uh, as well. Also, a couple of uh, points to make note before we get into uh, the Fed and, and the Brexit update was uh, a rumour reported by the Financial Times on, on Twitter anyway, uh, that Nigel Farage would be stepping down. Um, however, if this is not true, that uh, and definitely remains a, a problem. But on the idea uh, and comment that he did, the pound did push higher, spiking higher. Uh, you can see here, let's go back to last night, really starting from around sort of 650 and beyond. This also was the time uh, that the US dollar started to weaken again though, so a bit exaggerated on that. Uh, and there's been no confirmation, concrete confirmation that Nigel Farage in the Brexit party will be stepping down, which of course, in theory, would uh, help Conservatives take more of a majority uh, and less focus uh, elsewhere on that. So just going over to uh, the headlines um, and a tweet from, and this was going back to, uh, to Tuesday, just on the calls of the general election. So. Nigel Farage tweeting, at last, deadlock in Parliament is broken. Brexit now has a chance to succeed. Um, while that may be true, I think that's only true if Conservatives get a majority. So we, we said this yesterday in the briefing that perhaps the biggest hurdle for uh, a deal coming to play is this man and the Brexit uh, party. Uh, so this rumour would have been uh, met, if true, with uh, definitely pound positive. Uh, on the idea that he's not going to be looking to take some uh, seats away from the, the Conservatives. 
a couple of uh, comments overnight in the uh, let's bring this in the Daily Mail, of course. So ignore the the early way as Essex headlines on the right hand side. I'm sure you're not uh, that interested in, in those. But Nigel Farage saying his Brexit party will target Labour Leave seats rather than Tory ones to clear out the Remainer Parliament uh, amid Conservative fears that strategy could still deny Boris Johnson a majority. On paper, that would uh, would be fine. Uh, but there's certainly some analysts um, and research has that are uh, saying they're concerned on the pound at the moment. Some even saying they're short, uh, just due to the fact that uh, you know, Nigel Farage could be uh, the fawn uh, in this push to, to gather a, uh, a bigger uh, majority. So Nigel Farage was saying this and speaking actually to the Financial Times yesterday. So that rumour probably was fake and it would still be one I'd be looking out for. Uh, but uh, here are some of those seats. You might not be able to see this. Here we go. Let's just zoom in. Uh, the top 10 marginal seats where the Brexit party could split the Tory vote and therefore hand victory to Labour or Lib Dem. So this is on the flip side of perhaps Nigel Farage's plan. If he uh, was to go down the route uh, and targeting these 10, taking away from Tories um, the votes, and obviously Labour or Lib Dems could, could come away with... Uh, uh, a bit more of a, a vote and of course the, the the we'll go over a couple of pound scenarios but anything other than a conservative majority is is is, is going to be i would say uh well i guess if the lib dems were to hold a massive surprise then you'd see pound positive but basically if the conservatives don't get a majority i do think will come under a bit of uh, pressure for for the pound and and that's kind of what we're we're saying here in the Bloomberg article as well. That the headline says it all. Pound investors' biggest fear on Snap UK election isn't Corbyn, and it's all about Nigel Farage. But let's just have a, a quick look through some of the the worst and best case uh, scenarios for for the pound. And just before we do so, I'll bring in the uh, the pound chart. And I was and we what are we up to now? And it almost one thirty. And I was saying yesterday, I, I think we. Over by the time we get to December the 12th, I think we get a conservative majority, and I think we come up to uh, 135. Just the resistance from the beginning uh, of March and, of course, September last year. Big level, big hurdle to get through the 130, but I do feel uh, we can continue to push up, uh, albeit helped by maybe a bit of a weaker dollar uh, as well. Let's have a quick look over these <coughs> scenarios. The worst case, Brexit party coalition. So the biggest issue over the last six months for, for the pound when we started coming down was the idea that no deal has a higher chance of happening. We saw us reach 120. Yes, we reversed since then, but that's no deal being taken off the table. If Brexit party come in and with the coalition, they're going to be pushing for that. Uh, so to keep it simple, that is going to be bad for the pound uh, and therefore increases the chance of no deal. While I still think no deal is, you know, you're 1%, 2%. It has to be priced into the markets uh, if they were to get in. Uh, I still think that would be a buy the dip situation later on, but that's just going to be going to be a nightmare if that was uh, to, to happen for, for the pound um, and obviously Conservatives and Boris Johnson as well. Best case, Johnson wins Brexit deal. So, And this is very much what the markets, you would say, are just expecting. I wouldn't say it's fully priced in because there's, of course, the uncertainty of a general election but this would be the best case Johnson to win a majority and the analysts here saying our central view is we probably assume that Johnson does manage to cobble together a government and he gets the deal through um, who expects the currency could rally more than 2% to 132 uh, sort, of, sort of midway between uh, my target uh, and where that would go so we'll we'll see uh, over time how that comes through uh, as well I guess best best case scenario and this is unlikely of course uh, would be no Brexit, no deal, not no deal, no Brexit, uh, and the pound would rally quite nicely. And uh, I would say this is more a Lib Dem win rather than, than Labour. Uh, and this is what they're saying as well. A surprise Labour win could see the pound fall in the short term, but in coalition we would expect Labour to be more moderate than maybe feared, like we saw with uh, Syriza in, in, in Greece. Um, so... Yeah, I, I bet the best case is no Brexit and no hard left economic agenda. So I think if if Labour were to pick up in the polls, you see you'd see pound come under a bit of pressure. Uh, but it would again, I think, if they were to to get into a 
you know, a majority or a coalition with Lib Dems, then you would see Pound uh, push higher eventually. I do feel that would be uh, the case. So one to keep an eye out on, on the whole Nigel Farage Brexit party. Obviously, over the coming weeks, there's going to be plenty of, of poll updates and, and, and so on. There was just one I saw earlier, probably not on my Twitter anymore. Uh, let me see if I can get it up. And it was a, uh, a poll done. If there was a referendum tomorrow, what would it be? And leave 46, remain 54% uh, from servation. Uh, but of course, you know, read what you want into polls at your peril, especially after the uh, well, the last election, the last Trump election, and of course, uh, the referendum uh, as well. Moving on uh, to the Fed from last night, uh, cutting a quarter point, so as expected, uh, to keep it short and sweet, uh, they now believe rates uh, and policy is about right, so they pause, they're, they're saying they're going to pause, and they would have to see a material miss uh, in data and everything else to start cutting again. Uh, they would only hike to fend off high inflation, which they see expectations uh, currently on the low side. So we cut rates for the third time, July, September, those previous. We're now looking to hold rates unless data worsens and we would only hike if inflation improves a lot more than we are expecting in summary uh, going forward. Uh, as with July and September, uh, George and Rosengren dissented, preferring to keep the rates on hold. Probably again worth over the coming weeks just keeping an ear out for, for them. Are they now going to turn ultra hawkish and actually say next year we could even get a, a rate cut at, at some point? Markets were pricing yesterday before the announcement uh, another cut last, uh, well, in, in the middle of next year. Uh, traders have unwound those bets, uh, certainly for a December meeting uh, and next year as well as, as the Fed saying they are, they are on hold. But with that big gap, with 41 days until the next uh, meeting, uh, the data is going to play a, a big part. Um, you also had the economic forecasts uh, in that December meeting, which we didn't have yesterday along with the rate projections, making it unclear yesterday just how many non-voters on the committee had also penciled in a reduction. So December is going to be a key one, uh, probably one of the last real key events uh, of uh, of the year along with, let me see here, so yeah, it is 41 days, next day 11th of December, and then of course on the Thursday you're going to have the general election. So they're probably up, right up there, the 11th and 12th is a really key uh, time for uh, markets in, in general. Some comments from Powell, um, the, well, he said, the, well, in the statement, before we go on to those, those comments, uh, they altered their language, and this was the rumoured thing that they were going to do, and it came to fruition, um, that uh, they're dropping the pledge to act as appropriate to sustain the expansion, and then they added uh, a promise to monitor, to monitor data as it assesses the appropriate path of the target range for the federal fund rates. Powell went on to say uh, he believes monetary policy is in a good place um, and that we see the current stance of policy is likely to remain appropriate as long as the incoming information about the economy remains broadly consistent with our outlook. Um, and then, so if we go back to the charts, let me just bring in, uh, we'll start off with the euro. I guess it's not a bad one to, to have a look at here and I'm just going to bring on the pivots to give us a bit of time. Make it clearer. So you can see, and now I'm going to put this onto the five minute. At, at this moment, we were still really pushing down. And it wasn't until he started talking, unbelievably, uh, the market here is, is basically saying, what, we're not going to cut, uh, we're not going to raise rates now? Uh, and the dollar weakened. So these comments uh, from, from, tr uh, from Powell were saying, we would need to see a really significant move up in inflation that's persistent before we could, we would consider raising rates to address, in, address inflation concerns. So this unwind of the, the hawkish cut that was perhaps expected on the idea that they're not looking to raise rates anytime soon unless inflation markedly improves, which is not expected to do. And then euro pushed higher. The low coming in on that date on the futures around 111.13 uh, and we just moved up uh, sort of 70 
pips or so from then. And we confirmed a push this morning as well on the S&P. You can see pushing higher overnight, uh, although just drifting lower a touch from that all-time high. Gold uh, saved really as well because those levels where it was trading down at really key. If we can get a close below there, uh, and then we are really looking down to the 11th and, and below. So gold helped, but we are just hitting some key resistance uh, traded from the low of the 25th. So key level traded in gold and now above the 1500 uh, handle. Back to uh, the headline. So we were basically to, to finish up in, in that summary, um, the, it was a hawkish cut, turned dovish on the high bar to raising rates because of inflation remaining muted. Other comments, uh, just to go through a couple of uh, Bloomberg economists. The October FOMC post-meeting uh, communique proffered the possibility of additional policy, policy easing, but dialed back the degree of certainty through subtle language changes. This is consistent with the Bloomberg economics expectation that officials would aim to preserve optionality around upcoming meetings, even though we expect tepid economic data to ultimately compel the Fed to act. So we're, we're broadly speaking right now, we're quite well balanced. If the data is going to be poor over the next couple of, of weeks and a month, I guess, uh, then a month and beyond, then the Fed will obviously uh, have to look to start changing. But on the flip side, if the data was really strong, inflation picks up, well, hang on, we could now be looking to uh, raise rates at some point uh, next year uh, as well. Also, uh, well, yeah, here we can just go before we move on uh, to have a couple of comments. This is the, the CME pricing in of the next rate decision. So only 17% expected for... Uh, ease, no change expected at 83%. January meeting, you can see relatively uh, similar, uh, I guess, but a slight increased chance of, of an ease by then. Comments overnight, not a massive mover, but the Aussie has been pushing higher, as with a, a, a majority of these dollar pairs. Uh, an RBA board member worrying about the Fed easing and, easing and how that will just strengthen the Aussie dollar. Uh, and they're speaking on, on behalf of the RBA saying they you know, are happy with how things are going, but we don't want uh, uh, a higher exchange rate. And obviously if the US were to keep cutting rates, weakening the US dollar, well, the other currencies are gonna strengthen and, and the Aussie just not wanting this. So just be aware, perhaps at the back of your minds, if any further comments from RBA members about monetary policy in a bid to almost go into a currency war with the US and, and look to, to, to devalue theirs. Let's have a quick look over at the Aussie dollar, just over maybe 240 going back to October. It looks very similar, doesn't it, to the euro and the S&P and those lows from the beginning of October, euro and the pound, I should say, uh, from the beginning of the October here. And we have just been pushing higher. So it's one thing to bear in mind with uh, these currency pairs as they do push on. And we are looking, you know, uh, percentage wise, certainly for the Aussie anyway, up near 4%, the pound we know has done more than that. Uh, and the euro from that low, probably looking at about two and a bit, three, yeah, two and a half. You know, these currencies do push on, worth keeping a, an ear to the ground on any central bank speak from uh, their own uh, central banks uh, to become perhaps a bit more dovish. I do believe in coming time, there'll be a good opportunity to go short euro dollar, short Aussie dollar, and a bit of dollar strength coming back into the market. Uh, but seems not to be the case just uh, just for now. Also overnight, and, and it went under the radar, uh, really. We had earnings out of Apple and Facebook, which if there wasn't a, a central bank meeting from the FOMC, would have definitely been more of a market mover. So it went under, uh, under the radar, both beat expectations, uh, and it's kind of like swept under the carpet now and uh, and move on. Apple's fourth quarter, the company posted earnings of 3.03 of per share, uh, when in ex expected of, of 2.83, Facebook 2.12 versus the 1.91. Of course, could go into more detail, but the markets have really forgotten uh, about that now and a, a case of just sort of moving on. Also overnight, Bank of Japan uh, hinting they're willing to cut interest rates further. Uh, had tweaked its forward guidance with uh, an explicit hint it was willing to cut rates further into negative territory as part of a new effort to achieve its 2% inflation target. Uh, 8 to 1 majority, 
Uh, overall reaction was, was pretty limited. It was as expected and, and a, really a, a role of the Bank of Japan to, to meet market expectations, which was dealt with um, quite well. Um, the decision to tweak forward guidance suggested that Bank of Japan did not want to disappoint expectations uh, and the economy, the Japanese economy, was strong enough to get through a period of sluggish global demand without the need for directional additional easing yet. Uh, looking at the calendar for the day ahead, it's uh, a two-pager. Always good to see that um, on the on the sheet. Let's have a, a quick run through as we go. Well, we're coming up to 8.30 now. A big chunk of data out at 10 o'clock. You've got Italian inflationary numbers, European GDP as well. You've got the flash year-on-year uh, -year, uh, numbers as well. So quite a, a lot coming out at 10. So European assets, I would say, from 9.30, just a case of cleaning up the order book and preparing for that. Uh, then going into midday, you've got personal income out of the US, you've got core PCE, we know the Fed look at that. You've got uh, GDP out of uh, the Bank of Canada, we saw their reaction to, to rates yesterday as well. Chicago PMI uh, 145, obviously still everything an hour earlier uh, than, than normal. Uh, and then you've got only one speaker where no comments really have come through yet. Some earnings to be aware of uh, as well, but none of the, the real uh, big big companies uh, they are done for the week, shall we say. Looking at tomorrow, of course, we've got um, non-farm payrolls. ADP yesterday, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the, uh, the calendar there, but um, I said the times. Uh, having a look. At tomorrow, you've got obviously non-farm payrolls, uh, and with ADP only coming in a tiny bit expected, not really giving too much uh, in the clue of a hint whether that could be much better uh, or worse. Obviously, unemployment rate average hourly earnings coming out as well. Got some Japanese data, Australian data, Chinese data overnight, uh, and then a few speakers uh, as well, and of course Lagarde taking office. Quick shout out to Mario Draghi on his last day. Let's have a quick look over the key moments uh, over the last uh, what we're talking now eight years so cutting rates on the within first few days of ECB president anyone that's done the uh, the sales and trading or then the portfolio management simulation from from amplifier will remember that well uh, the whatever it takes speech cutting rates below zero QE launched uh, and then ending uh, back in 2018 before this new uh, package has come through. The euro, of course, has been on a bit of a journey. I remember when I first started trading 2014 uh, into 15, a lot of talk was about uh, the euro against the, the dollar going to parity. It just never quite materialised there, uh, recovered a bit, uh, and then obviously we've seen the dollar strengthen over the last couple of years quite dramatically. Uh, but are we, have we seen, is the worst now behind us uh, for the euro? I suggest not, but time will tell. Something nice to finish on, uh, a couple of facts on Burko. Uh, how much does the speaker speak? So here, going back to the 1920s, proportion of all words in common spoken by Mr. Burko and previous speakers, it's not really a surprise to see he is at the top there. Um, and I'll put these on my Twitter as there's some words that I'm not even going to try uh, and say, but uh, uses here's some of the words that he's used more times uh, than that no other speaker has said in a hundred years. Chuntering has been said 173 times. Uh, but yeah, many of those I, I won't be able to, to pronounce uh, as well. But shout out to, to Draghi, to Burko. Good luck to Lagarde starting tomorrow. There is no Brexit today. Uh, well, that's obviously been pushed down. Uh, in summary, the Fed, a hawkish cut, turned dovish initial reaction. The pound, I'll just be keeping an eye out for Farage and his comments are if the Brexit party stand down, the pound is a buy. Uh, and of course, over the coming days, I'm sure there'll be uh, some polls to keep an eye on as well. Hope you'll have a, a good, good day ahead. Any questions as usual, please do let us know.